Hi, I'm Larry Puckett, the DCC Guy. Today, I want to talk about track plans. A couple of sample track plans, one for the US and one for the UK, that could be used on the uh, modules that I've been showing you how to build for the last three weeks or so. So let's go ahead and get started. Okay, before we get started, I want to ask you to take a second to subscribe. Click on the subscribe box, and when that comes up, click on the little bell right next to it and click all. That way you'll be notified every time that I upload a new video. Now, as far as the track plans, as I said, I have uh, put together a US and a UK version uh, to use on these modules, and they use the exact same track plan with a couple little squiggles uh, here and there for interest, and I'll go over those in a minute. Uh, you know, as far as the US stuff, I've been looking at US track plans for 40, 50 years now, so I have a pretty good idea of, of what I would apply in a number of cases there. Uh, I'm kind of new to the, new to the UK uh, uh, scene as far as that goes, but over the last couple of years I've done a lot of research. And one of the best sources that I found is this book by Paul Corral uh, on Great Western Railway Branch Lines. And uh, this is the combined edition. He also produced a volume one and a volume two uh, of this book, and uh, it has much, much larger diagrams of buildings and everything in it. But the great thing about this is it has a variety of track plans for railway uh, branch line termini all over the UK, uh, within the GWR territory anyway, and it gives you the track plans for those uh, stations. It gives you operating schedules from the 30s and also post-war era, and uh, you know tells you which locomotives in many cases operated on those branch lines, uh, and, and just a lot of excellent information. And it is just literally filled with photographs of the area at the time. So, you know, this, for a GWR modeler, this is the Bible, as far as I'm concerned. So if you, uh, I found uh, this on, I believe, Amazon Books. I have uh, the volume one and the volume two, as well as this combined edition. Like I said, these are a great resource for the GWR in the, uh, particularly the pre-war era, but also to a certain degree in the post-war era as well, because he does provide you with schedules you know, post-1948, roughly. So, take a look at that at your local library or pick one up at a train show uh, that you might go to or take a look at uh, Amazon and uh, also on eBay you can uh, find these at times. So that's a great resource. Uh, also, for me, little books like this. This is about the Tain Valley line down uh, um, that ran between Exeter and the Morton Hampstead branch, and it's it's a great resource. And there there's little booklets on this for a lot of these different branch lines where you can get specific information. So let's go ahead. I have the track plans uh, set up on my computer within a. a program that I, I use called CAD Rail for designing model railroads. And we'll go ahead and take a look at those track plans uh, individually and go over some of the concepts and ideas that I uh, uh, thought about when I was uh, putting the track plan together and how I would operate it. And we'll go from there. Let's go ahead and start with a look at the US version of the track plan. And you can see uh, in this track plan, the squares are one square foot. So we've got eight foot long and two foot wide. And I'm assuming we'll call this e, uh, east here and west here. So uh, we could be going uh, and coming from staging yards at each end, or we could be connected to other modules at each end. And uh, that allows us to move trains into this switching area, and then they can depart at either end. So you could have a passenger train coming in from the east, and I'm assuming right-hand running, we're in the United States, and so a train would come in from the east here and stop at the train station if it's a passenger station train, and uh, after it's made its stop, it can cross over here and exit uh, to the west and into staging, and then you could reverse that for future runs of that uh, passenger train. And you could have uh, passengers coming and going on a regular basis, as well as freight trains. Now. As far as the layout, 
Um, I've got seven industries shown here, and there's a lot of potential things that you can do with this many industries. Um, obviously, this is meant, uh, this was designed, assuming it was, you know, a semi-rural type of, of, of setting. Uh, if you wanted a more complex um, urban type uh, setup, and uh, it would have a number of different industries all clustered together that could be worked uh, with one uh, trip or one visit of a train. But at any rate, <clears throat> let's assume that a freight train comes in here from the west and arrives on this track here. You've got to have this ability to run around your train in order to break it up and work these facing point uh, industries and trailing point industries simultaneously. Um, so let's look at the individual industries and tracks here uh, as part of this layout. We've got a freight depot here next to the passenger station. That was fairly common in, in a lot of railroads that they would orient them this way. Um, that way the crew that's taking care of the freight depot uh, could also you know, be stationed at the station and do double duty. Um, but at any rate, you could you know, bring in a couple of cars and, and drop them off and pick, them, pick up uh, loaded cars, that car, or empty cars in most cases, but they could be loaded. Uh, also uh, over here, livestock corrals. Uh, you know, they were fairly common through the 1950s in the U.S. and uh, in, in some areas even later than that. So you've got the potential to bring in uh, empty cars and pick up loaded cars here at the livestock corral. Um, <clears throat> coming down into the other side of the track, uh, I've positioned this grain elevator here uh, to hide the fact that you've got uh, trains uh, disappearing and entering uh, through the hole in the wall type of effect here. And uh, you could actually, you could disguise this another way by putting a, uh, a hill here with a tunnel portal uh, for the trains to go through and disappear. Uh, there's a number of different ways that you can hide the fact that uh, trains are coming and going through a hole in the wall. But at any rate, a, a tall building located in this area will disguise that fact quite nicely. It could be grain elevators, it could be vertical oil storage tanks, uh, any of those kind of, of, of things. Um, and, you know, it gives you the opportunity to uh, add a little bit more uh, uh, variety to your uh, operations and the cars that are going to appear in your consist. Okay, coming down into the uh, small yard, if you want to call it, we have a small industry located here, and I've shown it with a, uh, a, a track that disappears and runs through the building. And these type of internal loading docks were very common in the northern part of the U.S. Uh, because of, you know, winter conditions and snow and the like. It was easier to uh, work cars if they could come into a building like this. They were much less common in the south. And, uh, I, you know, they're more common now than they were at one time, but uh, generally an outdoor loading dock would be uh, more appropriate for, uh, for the south and um, probably the mid-continent, uh, mid-Atlantic states, that kind of thing. Um, but at any rate, so you just use a smaller building with a loading dock on this side. This uh, one here I've, I've uh, designated a team track where, you know, you can have trucks coming in and, and, and loading and unloading directly uh, from cars that are parked in here. So that's a, a, a nice little operation that you can add some more variety. Uh, it doesn't tie you into a particular type of industry. It can be any industry that can, you know, ship in a, in a boxcar or, or, or a, a flat car, whatever. And down here I've designated pulpwood loading. You know, pulpwood was very big in the U.S. for railroads well into the 1960s. Uh, the last one that I saw operating was in Berkeley Springs, West Virginia. Uh, in the mid-1980s, I believe it was, close to 1990, and uh, uh, I, I, I don't remember seeing any after that, but there might be some still around. I don't know. Most of what the railroads haul these days are wood chips, and uh, large um, uh, uh, hoppers full of wood chips are very common uh, being transported uh, by the railways now. But at any rate, the thing I like about having a pulpwood operation right up front is that you could have low relief stacks of pulp uh, logs here in the yard area 
and a loader that could uh, load those uh, uh, directly onto the cars, but it's not going to be anything so tall that you can't see what's going on here in the background. So this is good for an upfront operation. And you've got an office here, a small office building with a scale attached to it to weigh the uh, loads of pulp coming in and then you know the empty trucks going out so you know how many uh, how much they uh, how many tons of, of pulp logs they delivered. And um, coming down, I've uh, put on this uh, lead a, uh, a coal yard. And again, that's a, a fairly low relief uh, operation that could be located up front, although there's nothing here in the background for it to, uh, to cover up and get in the way with viewing. So you've got a small elevated coal trestle where coal can be dumped directly onto the ground and uh, trucks can come in and you can have coal loaders, either a front end loader with a bucket on it uh, uh, to load uh, coal or a, uh, uh, one of the, the small uh, uh, coal loaders that they used uh, uh, in the earlier years here that were you know, self-powered that could move coal into a, uh, into a truck. So that's a neat operation and again a small office and a scale associated with it to uh, weigh the empties and the loaded trucks. Um, other than that, this is a fairly straightforward operation. I think there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten uh, switches here, and uh, these could be operated either, um, you know, by if you're using say Pico or microengineering, they have little spring clips uh, built into them so that you can just literally move the points with your finger and they'll stay in position. And that's one way of doing that. You could use uh, tortoise switch machines or you could use some of the uh, choke cable type activated um, uh, manual throws that are available on the market today. And I'll, I'll show you some of those when we get around to installing these kind of things later on. But at any rate, uh, there's just a lot of variety here. You've got seven industries. Should keep you busy uh, for a while operating this type of, of, of layout. I'm going to uh, 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 try to uh, place this track plan on my website, which is uh, www.dccguy.com. And uh, I will add this uh, there in a post uh, uh, on that website. And you should be able, if, you know, if I remember how to do this anymore, you should be able to just click on the track plan and download it. I'll try to save that as a PDF for everyone. So there will be a US version and a UK version. I'll probably just put them both together. But at any rate, that way you can download it and get a, a look at this. Let me go ahead and move on now to the uh, UK version. Now, this is the UK version. You can see it's essentially the same track plan as the one that I just uh, showed for the US version. What I did was I turned it a few degrees uh, here so that you're entering at about six inches in from the back and exiting at about a foot uh, or about the middle of the layout here. And I think that by turning it just a little bit at a slight angle, it, it you know, it breaks up that linear type of, uh, of situation where the tracks are following the, you know, the front of the layout and just, you know, adds a little bit more interest into this. So let's look at, at this specific design. And again, uh, east here, west here, and assuming a staging yard, fiddle yard of some kind at each end, or a connection to other modules of your own or someone else's. So coming in here, and again, since we're in the UK, we're going to assume left hand running. So a train would come in, let's say it's a passenger train coming from the east, would come in, cross over, and be able to stop at this small platform here across from the main platform, sta uh, main station platform. Passengers could, uh, you know, embark and depart there on this small platform. And let me point out that this design here is not actually based on a Great Western Railway design. Uh, it's a combination of the design at uh, Torrington, which was on the Southern uh, Railway in uh, west, northwest uh, Devon. And, um, they had this type of operation pretty much set up and but you know this is also very similar to what you would see on a lot of, uh, of GWR designs as well. Uh, but anyway let me go on and uh, not digress so much. Uh, basically here though 
uh, because the passengers need to get across the track and the uh, railways in the UK uh, generally discourage passengers from trying to cross directly across tracks themselves. So what I've got here is this elevated uh, bridge over the tracks and often what they would do is put steps up at each end of the bridge where passengers could come off the platform, walk up and across and back down again. Or they might have an elevated passenger uh, walkway for them to cross. Uh, on you know more rural lines that weren't very busy, uh, you know they might have looked the other way and let the passengers cross at a uh, a wooden walkway across here. So that you know that's one option. Uh, but this was you know this is designed as a through line on um, the Tain Valley uh, a line to Exeter between Exeter and the Morton Hempstead line. So eh, it's going to be pretty busy as far as uh, things go. Okay, so let's say we've got our station here with the long, uh, longer, bigger platform on the, on the main station side and a smaller passenger platform on the other side. Uh, I've got a dock here. Now this dock you could use for you know, loading milk uh, 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 containers directly from the platform into one of the GWR siphons or uh, some of the other uh, cars that they carried milk in and uh, hauling them out or you know something like one of the uh, self-propelled uh, uh, passenger cars like the GWR flying banana could come in here and pull into the dock and uh, not be restricted to using the main line. So there's a couple of different options there. You could also put the cattle pen back here behind the dock. That was very often done as well uh, on GWR uh, uh, stations. Uh, I've placed the signal box down in here between these two uh, uh, lines that go up to the dock and to the engine shed. And um, you know, it wasn't that common to have engine sheds. You might have one on a branch, and um, but many of those closed early in the 20th century and they were used for storage or, or, or you know, or, or taken apart basically. And you know, you got your local coal here, so you could uh, bring in a uh, uh, an occasional wagon of coal uh, to be unloaded into the uh, uh, into local coal here, and uh, you might have the uh, switch engine stationed here uh, on a permanent basis, or it could be the branch engine if this is a terminus. Of course, you would have a uh, a water tank here. They were often on GWR built into the engine shed, and then you might also have one out here on the platform. Uh, and, and you would also would have a water column located either here or here, um, uh, depending on, on the uh, setup. Um, let's see, the signal box controls the mainline switches. I'm not having them control any of the switches in the uh, yard area over here at all. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look then at what I've set up here in the yard. Um, first off, the good shed. In the U.S. we call that a freight depot, in the U.K. it's called a goods shed. And again, I'm using the same type, uh, same building here, uh, and this was a very common operation to have uh, uh, the ability for the uh, wagons to be uh, uh, unloaded inside of the shed or inside the building. In this case, though, at Torrington, uh, they had a big milk loading operation, and they had a rack here where they could park three uh, tank cars and load them with milk and three inside of the shed itself plus you know they would have a string of them out here in the yard waiting to be unloaded or loaded excuse me and they ran at out of Torrington they ran two trains a day with uh, with with milk and so there was you know it was a fairly good sized operation but this was this type of, of milk loading was also very common on many of the rural uh, uh, GWR lines uh, particularly in Devon and Cornwall and that area. We could also have a, uh, a yard crane located right about here for loading and unlo unloading cars on these uh, uh, tracks here. And uh, I actually included a small platform here where you could even have a, a crane located on the actual platform itself to uh, load and unload uh, materials. So uh, across from that, I've placed the cattle uh, pen here and as opposed to up by the station. Um, in looking at a lot of track plans for the UK and the GWR, it seems like it was about 50-50 as far as where the pat cattle pen would be located. Um, 
I've always wondered, you know, I, I can see the, the rationale for placing it up here next to the station so that the station crew could deal with the farmers bringing their cows in and also to make sure that the cattle stayed uh, watered um, and, and in good health before they're loaded into uh, the, uh, uh, the cars that are brought in for them. So, uh, but also you got the smell up here offending the, uh, the sensitivities of the passengers. So um, I, I figured, well, you've got a good shed here, put your cattle down there, and the crew working the good shed could take care of the cattle. Okay, so we've got that operation. Um, very common to have a coal, a domestic coal uh, uh, dealer located in a GWR um, uh, yard area where that you would have these staiths located where you might have a couple of wagons parked and the coal unloaded directly into them. And the dealer here would, uh, uh, would have a set of scales to weigh out coal to be loaded into uh, you know, uh, his uh, customers' wagons and the like. Um, further down, I've put in a, uh, a gas works. And gas works were very common in a lot of, end of, of, of uh, towns throughout uh, England um, uh, during the early part of the 20th century. And um, they, they consisted typically of the main building, which had the retort for producing the uh, gas. And then there would be a number of smaller buildings, uh, outbuildings here for, you know, where the uh, contaminations would be removed from the gas as it was pumped out. So, you know, you want to move the sulfur so you don't get that sulfur rotten egg smell when the gas is burned by your customers. And then you would have the gas holder located here. Now I've put these here so that they block the fact that your trains are coming and going through the hole in the wall here and uh, on this track that leads out to your, uh, to your staging yard or your, uh, to your um, fiddle yard. So um, these gas holders are available uh, in the U.S. Walther's makes a more modern version of a gas holder. Uh, I think, I know that um, at one time Hornby made a small gas holder. I have one of those uh, that I'm going to be using. And um, so you can find those on eBay and at train shows and the like. And they're a small gas holder. They're not, you know, one of these huge ones like you would find in a big city operation. But um, I know that, you know, there was one of these uh, type of setups in Ashburton, for example, right across from the station that was served, you know, by the, uh, by the, by the railroad. Um, it seems that it was not common, though, to have a siding uh, for, the, uh, for the gas works. Very often the coal would be unloaded uh, into wagons in the yard and transported to the uh, location of the gas works. Ashburton seems to be unusual in that you had one so close. But even there, I didn't, in the track plans, I don't see a, uh, a siding that goes directly up to the retort and, and, and area. Also, they didn't uh, apparently unload directly into the building itself. They typically had a pile of coal located uh, out next to the building that uh, where, it, where it could be shoveled into the, uh, into the retorts in the building themselves. So the coal was burned there to produce, the, uh, to produce gas, and that produced coke, and that could be actually used for heating. So uh, you might have coal coming in here, coke either being sold to you know, people in the area who might still be heating with uh, coke instead of gas, and also you might have a wagon uh, occasionally uh, being loaded with coke to be uh, shipped out to a dealer somewhere else. So those are just some of the things that you could do here. So you could have wagons of coal coming in, wagons for coke going out, and you know wagons of coal here. You could have um, cattle uh, 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 wagons here for the cattle to be loaded in, and various types of uh, you know, milk tanks uh, up in here and other types of uh, cars being brought, or wagons being brought in and loaded and unloaded here on this uh, additional track. So a lot of little operations that you can uh, use here. Also, uh, you know, this is a, a small escape track where a locomotive can, uh, can sit out of the way if a train is running through. Um, and I think that, you know, you've got enough industries here to keep you busy for uh, quite a while uh, 
running uh, trains in and out of here. So that's about it as far as uh, I want to cover here on the UK version. For you fellows in the UK that are watching this, you know, if I've gotten something really wrong, let me know. But, you know, this, like I said, it's based on a couple of years of research in a lot of uh, online materials, watching a lot of, of the uh, videos on, on uh, YouTube of, of these various operations and uh, also reading a lot of books uh, available. Uh, like the one I showed you, uh, Paul Corral's book uh, on GWR Termini. And let me also point out, one thing you could think about doing. If you're not interested in having dual staging yards or dual fiddle yards, one thing you can do is just terminate the track right here. So you've got two. Flip this uh, uh, crossover so that you've got it running this way. And that way, a, uh, a, a train could come in, passenger train or freight train, either one, could come in, and the locomotive could do a runaround and come back here and attach to the rear end and depart if it's a passenger train, or do some work at this end if it is a freight train, or you could come in uh, on this side. So, you know, you don't have to feel restricted to having a, um, a, a way for the trains to leave at this end. This can just be a dead end with a, uh, a and, and then operate this as a, uh, a, a, a terminus uh, type of depot and, uh, and, and operation. So that was very common uh, on a lot of the uh, a lot of the branch lines. They just about all had a terminus since as a branch line they ended uh, typically in a small town like this uh, with a branch line station. Um, Let's see, what else to show you? Oh, and if I did that, I would take this uh, bridge and elevated uh, roadway and move it over here to disguise the fact that you're coming and going uh, here through a hole in the wall. Okay, so those are some of the things that, that uh, I would do if I were going to build this particular track plan uh, for a UK GWR inspired uh, operation. Also, I'll point out that I am greatly influenced by Nick Wood's much Merkel uh, layout, which I think is probably very, very well known in the UK. Um, you know, there are just a number of videos available on YouTube of the much Merkel, the Ashburton line, and, and many others. Uh, Dartley is another very, very well known um, a model railroad in the UK. So take a look on, on YouTube for Dartley, Much Merkel, Ashburton. They're all very, very neat uh, track plans and neat setups for GWR operations. Well, that pretty much is a wrap for today. I hope that has given you some ideas of things to think about when it comes to designing a track plan for your model railroad. You know, um, I know people that that really sweat this stuff and they'll build and tear up and build and tear up and build and tear up trying to get just the right track plan that they want. And in many cases it's because they don't stop up and, and do the upfront planning uh, for operations, okay? I, I really do feel that you really need to sit down and think about how you want to operate the model railroad and the type of industries you want to have and, and that kind of thing and use that to guide the placement of your industries and your tracks and all of that. And also study a lot of track plans available in the um, hobby literature. Uh, there's been lots of track plans published both in the U.S. and the U.K. Uh, companies publish annual books on model railways and, and the like. And, you know, every month, very often, there's a track plan or two or three uh, that appear in these magazines. So go ahead and study those and get some ideas up front about how you want to lay out your model railroad. And that way you won't spend a lot of time building and tearing up and rebuilding sections of your model railroad so that you can get it right. Um, okay, on Friday, I'll be back with another video. This time, we'll take a look at uh, putting the uh, green foam uh, that I use on top of the plywood down and then uh, transferring the track plan that I showed you onto the actual, you know, the green foam so that we can then begin laying uh, the sub row bed and the track. So, have a good week and we'll see you on Friday. Stay safe and stay healthy. Bye now.